Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, January 31st. Glad to be with all of you. We are going to do two presentations this morning. Uh, we're going to start with Proclamation B, which is a proclamation recognizing National Mentoring Month with Councilmember Jawando and the County Executive who is joining us. Come on up. Come on. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, the County Council and welcome to all of our great mentors behind us here. Uh, we're going to introduce you. Let me let me actually do that now. So this is a proclamation that we're going to read with the County Executive uh, for declaring January 30, January National Mentoring Month. And we got in just under the wire here. So we're happy about that, um, even though we celebrate mentors all year round. Um, we have with us uh, Dayon Johnson, who's the Program Support and Outreach Manager at the D.C. Metro Mentor Organization. Atan Atanel? Antonio. Oh, okay, I got it spelled wrong here, sorry. Antonio from the Silver Spring YMCA Mentoring Program in the, in the National Capital Region. Hannah Cheney, is Hannah here? Hannah is sick, so we're going to send her our best. Allison Resnick, I know I saw from Future Link, um, and Andrew yes. Lavalar from Future Link, and Viana Mora from Future Link. Um, so, and so mentorship is uh, really important. Uh, you know, I often talk about the mentors in my life, but we all have them. We all have people who loved us, who poured into us, who taught us things. Um, and one of the great things about mentorship is that it's a two-way street. Uh, the mentors get just as much out of it as the mentees. And uh, and we never stop needing it, uh, no matter how old we are. You know, I'm a couple years younger than the county executive. We still need mentorship. Uh, all of us do. And we need connection. Uh, we need people to care about us. And it's particularly important in the lives of young people. Um, and so it's really an honor to declare this National Mentoring Month. Um, and we just would ask that everyone, especially with everything that we're going through now with our children, I just started my education listening tour yesterday as chair of the education committee and met with hundreds of students, all who said in different ways they're dealing with a lot right now. And their teachers, their parents, their loved ones, their after school programs, they need that now more than ever. And I think we need in this country, in this county, to have a offensive of mentorship. I'll just give you one really scary stat. Uh, I spoke earlier this uh, last year at the Big Brothers Big Sisters of America, which is one of the examples of many mentorship programs. They have a 37,000 student waiting list. 37,000. Uh, the vast majority of those students are young black men, uh, over 60 percent. That is just one program that's doing mentorship. So we need people to step up and be mentors. Let's not just declare it. But do it in all ways, formal and informal. You have great programs up here that you're going to hear about in a moment. We need you to step up. Our community needs you. We've always needed it, but we need it now more than ever. Um, I wouldn't be standing here today unless I had the mentors I had, and I know that's true for everyone in this room. So uh, I want to turn over to the county executive to make remarks, and then we'll allow our guests, and then we'll read the proclamation. So, so we have more programs than I could possibly list. We have, you know, Wings, we have Inner Ages, we have Every Mind, all these different groups, the American Bar, Bar Association, all do programs in the county to mentor. When I was a teacher, we had Inner Ages. I think we still have Inner Ages in the school I taught at. And as teachers, we would try to pick who would go into this program, and there weren't enough slots for all the kids we would pick. There were, you know, people who had classes where everybody could have been in there, but the staffing and such didn't allow us to even reach the need that we that we knew we had. So these programs are really important, and if you talk to the kids about how valuable it is, they really do need someone to talk to a lot of times. And having an adult who can have conversations, not necessarily mentoring isn't only about academics and trying to teach you math or fix you know, some something that you're not able to do. It's just about talking to you about life and about what, you know, what are your opportunities, what interests you, 
anything to kind of spark a student's engagement and interest. And so those are opportunities that we have. They make a difference for children. I saw that up close and personal when I was a teacher, and it really will help kids move forward. I, I look forward to, I know that the governor is proposing, you know, this one-year program for people, for students graduating high school. That could be a really big thing. But like everything else, it's going to require resources and it's going to require people willing to do that kind of work. So I want to thank all of you for what you do and know that we probably could have filled this with, you know, other layers of people who are doing the same work. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, Dan, do you want to come up first? Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dayan Johnson. I am the regional uh, manager for Mentor Maryland, D.C. Unfortunately, I don't work directly with kids, but I do get to work with many programs all across our state that are providing incredible resources and incredible services to mentoring organizations all across our state. Um, our organization, we provide consultative managerial services for these mentoring organizations so that they can grow, so they can build their capacity, so they can reach more kids. Our, our motto and our mission is that we want to increase the quality and the quantity of mentoring all across our state. Over the last couple of years, I've had the incredible privilege of working with programs specific to the Montgomery County family. I have a couple of them here today amongst many. Um, but the ones that were able to come today are FutureLink, who does it, they do incredible work uh, with our uh, students that have graduated from high school. And then we also have Antonio Perez, who is with the YMCA of Central Maryland. I've asked Allison Resnick, who, uh, so, who serves with uh, FutureLink, to just give a couple of brief words, because once again, we're so excited about all the programs that are doing incredible work in Montgomery County. And thank you, Council Member, for allowing us this opportunity. My name is Allison Resnick. I'm the Director of Mentoring and Education for FutureLink. And FutureLink works with first generation to college young adults who are low income as they navigate the complexities of the academic systems here and as they journey towards their uh, self-sufficiency and financial independence. So we work with them very closely and our mentors are a critical part of our journey with each student. They work with them one-on-one, -on -one, long-term. This is not just a three-month or six-month opportunity. The mentors work with our students for years as they go through community college, transferring to a four-year school, or if they take their journey towards a trade or some other um, opportunity. And as we've mentioned, they work with them on their soft skills, critical thinking, uh, transfer applications, scholarships, researching health insurance, the list goes on and on. But at the end of the day, the mentors make such a critical difference in our journey to success. So we really appreciate the um, partnership with Mentor and this um, acknowledgement today. So thank you. Let's give them a big round of applause. All right, so we'll read the proclamation. Whereas January 2023 marks the 21st anniversary of National Mentoring Month, a celebration that emphasizes the importance of mentoring and recognizes with praise and gratitude toward those who mentor, while also encouraging others to volunteer as mentors and Whereas Montgomery County honors volunteer mentors who support young people by showing up every day for them and demonstrating their commitment to helping them thrive. We celebrate the many organizations, formal and informal, that connect our youth with valuable mentoring opportunities and... Throughout... <laughs> Thank you. Throughout the different phases of the COVID-19 pandemic, mentoring programs stepped up to fill gaps for young people and families by connecting them with resources and ensuring that mentoring relationships continue virtually so that physical distancing did not lead to social disconnection. And? Whereas mentoring plays a pivotal role in career exploration and it supports workplace skills by helping young people set career goals, equipping mentors with the skills needed to support the professional growth of young people and driving positive outcomes for young people and businesses and? Whereas mentoring also encourages healthy choices 
as students who meet regularly with their mentors are more than 52 percent less likely than their peers to skip a day of school and youth who face an opportunity gap but have a mentor are 55 percent more likely to be enrolled in college than those who did not have a mentor now therefore be it resolved that the county executive mark elrich council member will jawando and the county council of montgomery county maryland hereby declare january national mentoring month and all the mentors, and we thank all the mentors who dedicate their time to bettering the lives of young people. Signed this day, 31st of January in the year of 2023 by myself, the council president and the county executive. Thank you for mentoring everybody and sign up. Okay, thank you all. The next proclamation is recognizing Aubrey's Make a Wish with council uh, with council members Katz, Jawando, and Sales. Good morning. So today we have a very special guest with us today. Everyone, please uh, welcome Aubrey. My name is Lori Ann Sales, and I'm um, one of the at-large council members and got a really special email from one of our residents from the Make-A-Wish Foundation. If you're not familiar, Make-A-Wish Foundation makes it their mission to give children who are experiencing hardships far beyond their years a life-changing wish. I feel like everyone knows a story of a great make-a-wish and that is in no small part due to the phenomenal work they do. They've been doing this work for over 40 years, granting 550,000 wishes Many of the children granted a wish have rare illnesses that oftentimes are difficult to identify or treat. Aubrey's journey began when she was just three years old. Despite the many visits to the doctor, Aubrey continues to live life to the fullest by dancing competitively and skiing down difficult slopes. Aubrey Campbell is a bright and resilient light in her family and her community. While we wish her well on her trip to Hawaii, right. <laughs> we should also take a moment and reflect on how we can continue to be resilient in the face of our struggles, just like Aubrey. And I'm going to invite uh, Councilmember Katz and then Councilmember Jawinda. Thank you very much, Councilmember Sales. You know, I actually, though I don't know Aubrey as well as I know her parents and her grandfather, they, they have been involved in Gaithersburg and Kentlands for many, many years. And, and Aubrey, we are so very happy for you that you're going to have this wish, and we know that you're going to always get better. But she's a fifth grader at Rachel Carson Elementary. And as, as uh, was mentioned, she's a competitive travel dance company. She's a member of a competitive t uh, travel dance company and a patrol lieutenant at her school. Right. She is described by her mom as a sunny, 
and positive person. And actually, I could say that about her parents as well. <laughs> They're positive and sunny. And she's going to be meeting with Governor Moore, and you are going to enjoy that, and Lieutenant Governor Miller, who's candidly a, a neighbor of, of uh, Kentland's. Uh, and to, for the Make-A-Wish, uh, Atlantic is in, as was mentioned, is in Bethesda, Maryland. The organization creates literally, literally, life-changing wishes for children with critical illnesses. And it has been mentioned the number of children's lives that they have changed is just remarkable. So congratulations. We look forward to hearing about your trip to Hawaii. And with that, I'm going to turn to my friend, Councilmember Jawando. I appreciate that. This is how much we all are happy for you, Aubrey. Um, I know uh, her, Aubrey and her family very well. They've helped out on campaigns and worn shirts, and they're very civically active in the Kentlands. Um, and, but I heard you just had a party at your school last week, right? And so that's just the start of all the people who are celebrating you. Um, and I know you like basketball like me, so that's why I've always really liked you. Um, and. We are so, so happy for you, and you're, you're an inspiration to us. You make us want to work harder and help more people because you've been so brave. So we just wanted to say we love you, and we were hoping you have a great time in Hawaii and take a lot of pictures, okay? All right. Uh, do you, anyone from the family want to say anything, Tina? Or, okay, so mom is going to say something on your behalf. So my name is Tina Campbell, and I'm Aubrey's mom. This is also Grayson, and oh, I lost a kid. There he is. That's Preston. We found, we found. <laughs> I know. There's so many of them. Uh, so Aubrey has uh, a number of autoimmune diseases. Basically what that means is that your immune system doesn't know which are the good cells in your body and which are the bad ones, and so it attacks everything. And so she has four uh, rare diseases. And one of those, um, actually she and Grayson have, and there are only nine reported cases in the United States. 5,000 adults, nine children with relapsing polychondritis. So um, what we've learned through all this process is that it's so critical to be a partner with your medical team um, and your community. Uh, we've spent between 400 and 500 sleepovers at the, uh, what we call the Teddy Bear Hospital at Children's National um, and also at Johns Hopkins. And uh, everyone has to work collaboratively because you don't know what to do. Um, so we've got also a rarity in that we have two Make-A-Wish kids, um, but his will come later. So hers will be Wednesday when we leave for Hawaii. So thank you to uh, Council Member Sales and her office for putting all of this together and organizing it for um, Council Member uh, Will Jawando and Council Member Katz as well. And for all of the support that you have given us through the many years that we've known you. And uh, we just hope to bring some awareness to rare diseases and uh, to the importance that it is to support children and family with these diseases. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to each take turns reading the proclamation. All right. Okay. Whereas rare diseases affect about 30 million Americans each year, it can sometimes take up to 10 years to correctly diagnose a rare disease. And this can often be attributed to a lack of awareness, resources, or visibility of symptoms highlighting the importance of education and research. And see, uh, Aubrey, we council members have to learn how to share too, and this is what we're doing. <laughs> Whereas the Make-A-Wish Foundation has made it their mission to grant children who are sick, many of them with rare illnesses, a single wish with the hope that the experience can be life-changing for that child, so far, they have uh, lightened the load of more than 550,000 children worldwide as they fight many terrible diseases, including Aubrey, by granting her wish of going to Hawaii and... Whereas Aubrey Campbell's struggle with rare diseases dates back to 2015, when she was only three years old. Since then, she has been diagnosed with three rare autoimmune disorders, 
in two rare infectious diseases. Each represents a new challenge for her and her family, but she continues to be strong and resilient. And you finish. Whereas, despite her disabilities, Aubrey continues to live her life. Whether playing basketball with her friends, competing with her dance team, or skiing on challenging black diamond slopes in Pennsylvania, Aubrey has shown that she can live a full life while dealing with medical challenges and despite many people not understanding the impact of rare diseases. And whereas Aubrey continues to be a bright light for her family and classmates, she continues to show that hope and positivity are enormously powerful during challenging times. Now therefore be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland hereby recognizes Aubrey Campbell for being a brave and intelligent young woman who inspires all those around her. And we thank the Make-A-Wish Foundation for granting her wish, signed this 31st day of January in the year 2023 by Council Member Sidney Katz, myself, Council Member Jawando, and Council President Evan Glass. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, thank you for those morning presentations. Uh, we are only a minute or two ahead of schedule, so we can go ahead uh, with our general business right now. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any announcements? Good morning, Council President, Council Vice President, Council Members. We have no agenda announcements today or petitions. Thank you. There you go. I was hoping to maybe I was eat up a minute or two. I was out and I couldn't. So sorry. <laughs> but foiled again. There we go. Uh, okay, well, maybe it'll take a minute or two for uh, for the next to tee up the the, the next uh, aspect of of uh, this morning's conversation. So, uh, I first want to start by thanking the residents of Montgomery County for stepping up and expressing interest in serving on the planning board. Uh, over the last number of months, uh, the planning board has been a body in flux. And back in November, when the previous council 
uh, uh, appointed five interim temporary members of the planning board. Uh, we said that we were going to kickstart the process and find more permanent replacements when this new council was seated because it was really important to make sure that this new body with a majority of new members uh, had their thoughts uh, heard during this conversation, important conversation about a very important uh, state mandated commission. And so when we had a call for applications, we received more than uh, two dozen applications from the community. One of those seats is specifically for a Republican. One of those seats is specifically for a Democrat. And the third seat is specifically for an unaffiliated uh, member of our community with regards to political parties. And so today, uh, I am pleased to ask Mr. Sean Bartley and Mr. David Winstead to, to come up to the table uh, as the two Republican candidates who we will be spending time this morning to interview. And I will um, share with my colleagues that this is the first of three panels that we will be having. Uh, today we are interviewing the uh, Republican uh, um, candidates. Next week we'll be interviewing the independent candidates. And the following week we'll be interviewing the Democratic candidates. And it's important for everybody to keep in mind that for uh, continuity and fairness, if anyone has any questions, that those questions be asked to all three, or in all likelihood four panels, because of the number of Democrats who will be, we will be speaking with. Um, and so to keep all of that in mind, I will be requesting of my colleagues that we limit our comments and questions to five minutes. If you have additional thoughts that you want to share after that first round, let me know. Uh, we can uh, schedule uh, another round, but uh, we will be keeping track of those five minutes. And so, uh, Mr. Bartley, Mr. Winstead, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I have a few questions I will ask, and then we'll open it up uh, to, to general comments. Um, Mr. Bartley, uh, what skills and experience do you have that is relevant for the work of the planning board? And can you elaborate specifically with respect to the board's role in the approval of development applications, the drafting of master plans, and the proposed update to the growth and infrastructure policy? Thank you, President Glass, and thank you, County Council, for allowing me this opportunity to interview with you today. I was so excited when Sarah Tannenbaum called me um, that I said, wow, and uh, cleared my schedule so I could be here today. Uh, I'm excited because I know I have the experience as a volunteer on local county non-charitable boards and as an attorney. I use my analytical skills and my leadership management skills to help the nonprofit board serve the community in Montgomery County. I'm connected to the community. I lived in Down County when I first moved to Montgomery County. I lived in an apartment community called Summit Hills. I met my spouse. We decided to have a baby. Then we moved to Mid County in White Oak. And we expanded our family to two children. And I said, you know what? I want to have a place where my kids could ride a bike. In Mid County, we lived in a townhouse uh, at the intersection of 29 in New Hampshire, White Oak. Then we moved up county. And I had the opportunity to have a house and a yard. And my kids could ride a bike. And I became friends with the farmers in up county, more notably Todd Greenstone, who's part of the um, Montgomery County Farm Bureau. So I'm connected to the community. I believe in the community, and I love Montgomery County. Of all the places I could have lived when I graduated law school I'm from California, I decided to move back to Maryland. I specifically chose Montgomery County. The work and the role of the planning board is one of executive leadership and decision making. I know there's been some upheaval, and based on my research and understanding, it seems as though the board was interfering with the day-to-day -day work of the planning commission and the team of professionals that take the initial investigative application and walk it through the process. I'm not a subject area area expert with regards to planning, but I am a lawyer and I'm able to rely on the information that other people provide and make decisive decisions and rely on the information that they've provided. My role as a chairman of other nonprofit organizations isn't to come in 
and hold people's feet to the fire in terms of their day to day work. They're credentialed professionals. The planning board has credentialed professionals. And so my job on the planning board and my role on the planning board is to ask tough questions. Is the information you're giving me correct? Can I rely on it? And if I rely on it, can I make a decision that best serves the community? When we look at Montgomery County, we're looking at the initiatives with regards to Thrive 2050 and the growth infrastructure policy. My role as a member on the board would to be to look at these plans um, and uh, development applications and look at them through the lens of policy and look at them through the lens of Thrive 2050. Are they going to be equitable and just? Are these plans going to encourage economic competition? And are these plans going to give us the community where everybody can participate? In, 20, in 1950, 1960, Montgomery County was 95% Caucasian or white Americans. Now it's 40% and 60% of the county is quote unquote minority. It's important as a person connected to the community is to get the whole picture of the county. Who's going to be served by our decisions and whether or not those decisions are going to meet the objectives of Thrive 2050. So my role on the board would be one as an executive administrator making decisions and encouraging the staff to be to be happy in their work, proactive in their work, and provide us with the information we need to make the best decisions for all the citizens of Montgomery County. Thank you. Mr. Winston, if you want to turn the button on. Different button. Nope. Yeah. Down by the base of the microphone wow. itself. Okay. There you go. No, lots of <laughs> buttons. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. President, members of the council, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I'm David Winstead, and I've met a number of you all, and some of the incumbents over the years. Uh, to the new members, I welcome you, and it's certainly nice to meet you. Marilyn and I have met in the past. Um, I'm a lawyer uh, and have had uh, 30 years of practice in in the region, Montgomery County and the region, and I've, uh, I'm a resident of Lower County in Chevy Chase, Maryland, where I've been on the village board for many years, and that involvement has been really looking at a lot of the issues that the planning board says on the county side in terms of traffic-related issues, growth issues, impacts of master plans, the Chevy Chase Bethesda master plan on our community, so that I really have a, a basic background and knowledge of both Montgomery County and the planning process and the responsibilities of the planning board. Uh, on, the, on their responsibilities related to the master planning process, I think my back, background can be very helpful in that I have spent an awful lot of time on the issues of infrastructure, adequate public facility, and transportation systems. I was uh, very lucky back uh, in my early years. I did a lot of zoning work in Prince George's County and got to know Governor Glenn Denning. And as a result of that, he asked me to be Secretary of Transportation in Maryland, which I served, was very pleased to have served uh, four years as Maryland Secretary of Transportation. So I'm very, very familiar with the county priorities that go to MDOT and very, uh, very familiar with the capital planning functions of both, obviously, the council and the county, but also MDOT in terms of how they look at priorities in Montgomery County. Um, uh, the important role both in, in looking at the master plan and vision for the county, as Sean mentioned, uh, the 2050 plan really does focus on the equity issues of growth, focuses on the adequate public facilities, as Italian and others are very familiar with, and also how do we begin to address the affordable housing problem and attainable housing, as it's called. I was looking at um, the agenda for the uh, planning commission over the coming year submitted to you all with the budget and we repeatedly the board will repeatedly look at that question both in terms of the transportation plan as well as the uh, Thrive 2050 plan so it will be part both early part of the year is rather later in the year they're taking that issue up in terms of uh, economic development issues that the board will face I do have an unusual perspective on that uh, as well. And uh, I've been appointed by Re Democrats, Paris Glenn Denning. I also was uh, uh, appointed by President Bush to head up 
the federal real estate agency called the Public Building Reform, I mean called the uh, uh, GSA Public Service Commission. So I spent four years really looking at the issues of growth and adequacy of public facilities on the federal level. Uh, GSA managed 1,500 buildings nationwide and about 180 million square feet of lease space. So I have a very strong understanding of the nature of public facilities and their impacts on growth and their impacts on, on workplace. I will tell you one of the challenges that not, is not necessarily in the, the plan as I look at it for the planning board this year, but one of the realities we're facing is because of COVID and because of the workplace habits that have been adopted by workers across the board, private and public sector workers, we're in for a shock, candidly. Uh, we have uh, downtown, there's no more than 40% occupancy in the office buildings downtown. I assume that in, in Montgomery County, it's a similar figure. Uh, candidly, you all are very responsible for Montgomery County fiscal budget. We're gonna, it's gonna have a big impact. The valuation of commercial properties in Montgomery County go down substantially, and it's gonna reduce revenues coming to the county. So, you know, planning board budget and county program budgets overall, we'll have to adjust and look at how do we do the job uh, efficiently. And so I do feel that my background, both in terms of being on a, count, a municipal board in, in the lower county, as well as these unique experiences I've had in transportation and in public facilities, will add a unique kind of perspective to board deliberations. And obviously, considering master plans, considering development plans, and also the other hat that we are, and that's park commissioners, to ensure that we have adequate parks, that we look at a plan to acquire new parks and new amenities for communities. Uh, I was very fortunate to participate in a project in the lower county, right on Western Avenue. It's called Western Grove Park. And Chevy Chase, together with the county, <clears throat> both put up money to take a site that would have been developed um, probably a single family uh, and converted it to a wonderful park that you all are probably aware of. It's a very metro-centric park called Western Grove and people from the Friendship Metro Station come up there, walk it, there's a fountain in the park and it's a lovely spot. So I've, I've seen firsthand an example of you know, what the county park system can do and the way they conduct their business. So that's just some initial um, introduction of myself. Uh, I will tell you candidly, a number of people called me from uh, the past, <laughs> you know, a head of the chamber and a, head, a former council member and others to say, would you know, would you be interested? And I am at a stage in my career where I have a bit more time and, and obviously the planning board is critical to, for you all as an advisor on land use planning and major master plans. And you know, I think it would be very interesting and I, I do feel given my background, I can provide unique contributions. Thank you. Uh, next question, I'll start with you, Mr. Winstead. Uh, what are the most critical issues you believe the board needs to address in the next two years? Oh, uh, Mr. President, I think the first one is obviously in the process of hiring a new uh, planning director, which I know is underway. But clearly, as Sean mentioned, clearly the Thrive 20, 2050 plan has really been recently approved and really needs to be delved into in terms of the, you know, basic principles that it had in, in terms of looking at a growth in the county, looking at centering equity and looking at the impact of uh, centering growth in corridors and in urban areas. And so I think a lot of the time will be taken up uh, you know, on that. In addition, I, I noted that we have the Germantown corridor plan, Wheaton, and many others. So there's a, a full agenda of work plan ahead. Um, but I do feel one of, the, one of the other challenges the board will have is continuing to look at the, uh, and I do totally agree with Sean that <clears throat> the staff is extremely talented and dedicated. Former colleague of mine is principal counsel now at the planning board, so I worked with her for a number of years. I think one of them is just continuing to assure uh, that the considerations of the board and the applications submitted are getting efficient expedited review. Uh, and part of that is clearly working with concurring reviewing agencies. Often the plans are accepted and noted as complete, but then they go out for review to WSSC and MDOT and, and, and uh, Montgomery County DOT and others, uh, um, the environmental agencies, et cetera. 
I think we need to continue to strive that those reviews and those concurrence are, are done in a timely manner and are coordinated. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of it on the federal level. There was a great deal of concern on the state level. I happened at the end of my tenure at Maryland DOT, I was president of AASHTO, and we were very concerned, which is the National Secretary of Transportation. So we were very concerned about the independent reviews that major transportation projects were getting on the federal level. And it, it, this goes back 15 to 20 years, but there was an effort to really try to coordinate that so that, you know, while DOT and EPA were reviewing applications, they were doing it concurrently and sharing information and trying to move it along. I think that's key. Many of you all have been major proponents of business, small business, and growth in the county. Part of it is being responsive to the needs of both development applications, the needs for facility and growth, and retention of jobs. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bartley, same question. Thank you, President. And check your mic. There Thank you, you President Glass. Um, I think there are three critical issues that need to be addressed immediately. Um, one is restore the confidence in the board. Two is examine all applications and proposal through the lens of Thrive 2050, the general plan, and make up for any delays in the approval process due to the pandemic. Uh, first and foremost, um, the council and uh, Mr. Albernaz did a great job in appointing interim members. You held a hearing, you did media press relations, and you did what was needed to maintain the status quo of the high level of respect the planning board had. Because of the activities of prior planning board members, we need to come in and establish the credibility of the planning board. We need to establish that we're here about the work of the county, we're here about the development of the county, and that when people submit an application or inquire about submitting the application, that they're going to get the coordinated professionalism and enthusiasm that these applications require. I'm dedicated to doing that. I have a high ethical moral standard, and I'm an attorney that looks to see how I can best serve. I'm a servant, and we need to focus on serving our communities. The second thing we need to focus on is examining and looking at every application through the lens of Thrive 2050. Equity, social justice, competitiveness, and environmental resilience. Everything has to be looked through through Thrive 2050 so that we can meet the outstanding goals and objectives that this council approved after much deliberation. We have to do it. We have to move forward. The community has changed. It's not a monolith anymore. There are varying interests with varying families that have transportation styles that they'd rather enjoy, family living styles that they'd rather participate in. There used to be a time in America where people would live in intergenerational homes. But when the general plan was first developed in 1950, 1960, there was this push towards a nuclear family and people leaving their home and establishing their own families and communities with individual families. Now there's a push with the um, diversity of our community where people want to have their parents live with them. Their, parent, their children don't necessarily want to leave home. I, I grew up in Southern California. When I say leave home, I mean leave the general area. I grew up in Southern California in a place called Riverside County. A lot of my friends left. I was a military brat, and so like getting up and moving was natural. But I have a lot of friends that grew up here in Montgomery County and didn't leave. And my friends in California said, why would you leave Southern California and come to Montgomery County? I said, you got to visit this place. You got to see why most of the people that grow up here stay here. They don't venture out because it's a great place to live. And the general plan did a great job in establishing the community that m made it a place where people wouldn't want to leave. And Thrive 2050, what that does is take in consideration everyone, the inclusive community, the Latino community, the Asian Pacific Islander community, the African American community that's been here for generations since the founding of the country, and the Quakers who helped liberate them in Up County and Western County along the shores of the Potomac. So we need to look at it through Thrive 2050 to address the inequities that were there. Funny story, many years ago I was talking to somebody 
who, who considered themselves a fair Republican. And he said, when we were growing up and we were sitting at the dinner table, we never considered anybody's race, religion, socioeconomic status, and I'm a good American. And I said, you are a good American. But the fact that you didn't address those things mm -hmm. calls into question your belief in everyone's opportunity to have a fair shot in our country and in our county. And I think what Thrive 2050 does is make you look at everybody's interest in the county, not just the dominant group. When you look at the um, slideshow presentation that showed down a breakdown of the county, 60% is minority, 40% is, is socioeconomically white, but it's still the dominant group, right? So that dominant group has an obligation to consider that other 60% that is made up of varying ethnic racial groups. So we have to look through the lens of 2050 and make sure we address everybody's needs and concerns. And lastly, if the pandemic caused a delay in any applications from being approved or looked at, or the dysfunction in the planning board because of the rivalries and the board getting involved in the day-to-day -day manage of those groups, we need to find a way to expedite it. If it means that board meetings have to last till 9 p.m., we have to do something to push forward the application process to give these developers a chance to, to uh, provide housing, especially affordable housings, to our ever-expanding community. Montgomery County is not only a destination for um, um, technical companies, but it's also a destination for many immigrants that are looking for their best shot at the American dream. And I think Thrive 2050 addresses the people who are residents here now, and it addresses the people who are migrating here to take advantage of the great opportunities that Montgomery County presents to them. Thank you for that. Thank you both. Uh, next question, uh, Mr. Bartley, we'll start with you. Do you have any limits on your availability to fully participate and prepare for board meetings? Well, I'm lucky enough to started my law firm in 2008, and I've grown the law firm to have a staff of five people, two attorneys that assist me. So I'll be able to dedicate my time um, that I now dedicate to the other nonprofits that I participate in. Well, Maryland State Board of Education. Education is not a nonprofit, but I devote a lot of time to that, and I also devote a lot of time to the Primary Care Coalition. But my team in my office is used to me being out of the office and working on court cases and volunteering. So I'm able to manage my schedule with my team that I have back at my office to devote my time towards reviewing the recommendations of the planning staff and reviewing the plans and making sure they comport with Thrive 2050 and be prepared for the meetings. I'm also uh, able to take testimony and understand what this testimony uh, is about to support all the applications that will be submitted. Thank you. Mr. Winston. Mr. President, uh, I am uh, available to, uh, to take on the work on the Thursday as well as the, the monthly meeting, the Bi-County Commission. I am busy, as you all are, uh, but I do feel, <clears throat> you know, that if it is not, you know, if it's something the council is supportive of, I can devote the time to do a good job. And, and like Sean, I think it's, we're fortunate in having a very competent uh, planning board staff. I understand the processes, and I'm, I've uh, chaired many meetings about capital programs over the years, so I feel I can deal with the applications coming in and the substance of those applications. Uh, the only other thing is that I, I will mention something that could be of help uh, recently, like Sean and some of the uh, community nonprofit. I was asked to go recently on the uh, board of the Homeless Law Center, which is uh, the group in Washington that really defends Title V, which provides for homeless shelters. And that, that exposure could be of help as well to the planning board. One of the things that people are not aware of is that under Title V, um, the homeless applicants, of which there are many competent ones here in the Washington area, Montgomery County, as well as around the country, can avail themselves of claiming on surplus properties. So as the federal government uh, disposes of surplus properties, a, a competent provider of homeless shelter can apply for it and, and provide, at, with no cost of land, can provide a very competitive situation financially to be able to bring it on stream. So I think there are opportunities. I mentioned earlier, I'm very fearful of the impact of working from home. I mean, it's a great luxury and it's a wonderful, I do it, I, I'm supportive of it, but it's going to have impacts. And I do feel there 
there will be in this region in Montgomery County more federal properties becoming available through that process over the coming years and I, it could end up being something helpful in terms of looking at where could you provide facilities and areas of need f for that population. Thank you. One additional question for me before I open it up. Uh, Mr. Winstead, we'll start with you. Are there any potential conflict of interests of which we should be aware? Mr. President, not really. I have, um, I have not been before the board in, in years. I, years ago, I used to go for the listen to some of the discussion of the transportation plan back when I was involved with that. Uh, but I don't envision there being a huge uh, conflict. If, if it were to come up, obviously, I would accuse myself. But I, it's not something that I envision. Thank you. Mr. Bartley? I don't have any. You're on. You're on. At this time, I don't have any uh, personal or professional conflict of interest that I could immediately address. But if there was um, a conflict of interest that were to arise, I would take immediate action and notify both parties in writing of that potential conflict of interest, ask whether or not I should recuse myself from hearing a particular um, uh, or reviewing a particular application for development. Um, and if there was the occasion where there was a conflict of interest, I would recuse myself from hearing uh, or taking any information with regards to that development application. Thank you both for, the, for all those responses. And I'm going to turn it over to Vice President Friedson, the Chair of the Planning Parks and uh, Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee. Still working on the name. Still working on it. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> President. First of all, thank you, Mr. Bartley, Mr. Winstead. Thank you for your willingness to serve in this role. Also, your many years of uh, commitment to the community and your professional expertise. We're, we're lucky to have you. The county's lucky to have you. And I think we're uh, in good shape here uh, with uh, the two of you. Um, I want to ask a question uh, about uh, climate and planning. So discussions surrounding climate change often overlook how important growth patterns are to how we live and the impacts that we have on our environment. The Planning Commission plays a critical role in facilitating how and where we grow, which has an enormous impact on quality of life and the sustainability of our county and our region. Could you please discuss how you view the intersectionality between land use planning policies that you'll be working on at the planning board and the environmental imperative that we have to build sustainable communities. Sure. Um, Councilman Friedson, I obviously the responsibility both in the the, twas, the, the Vision 2050 plan or Thrive 2050 plan, it, it does address the equity issue and environmental challenge uh, to sustain uh, sustainable growth. And I think part, basically that needs to be uh, guarded and, and reviewed based on applications and their potential impact in terms of jobs and public facilities, schools, as well as the, the focus of the report was again looking at urban centers and growth corridors that can best handle that growth. So I think a part of it is certainly recognizing that uh, growth provides jobs and is good. On the other hand, it should be done in a way that has the least environmental impact and the least footprint in terms of burden on public facilities and, and the population at large. I will say that we're certainly, in, in the concept of sustainable structures is well upon us. Um, I participate in a group called the Real Estate Roundtable, which is some of the largest developers in the country, and they have a subgroup that I'm on called Sustainable Buildings. And the science behind building sustainable buildings and achieving, you know, sort of zero admissions uh, is with us. You know, it, there, there's really the opportunities both through green energy materials, local materials absorbed in building, as, as well as the management of these properties. Um, you have some great landlords in Montgomery County, and many of them are uh, well in advance of this. Tower companies and learners have, you know, they have platinum lead buildings. Uh, which are performing with very little impact. And I think all the real estate community kind of acknowledges we're going to have to get our buildings to be really sustainable on its own energy and to not impact the environment as much as is the kind of construction and maybe the bulk of buildings. Uh, so I think uh, the board, you know, certainly would have the substance and talent on the staff to look at these issues. But I think in terms of the approvals of plans, we just ne need to basically look at the overall approvals you all gave uh, with Thrive 2050 and, and those principles, which are obviously equity, looking at a growth in downtown activity centers and, 
you know, and also integrating pedestrian and bike paths and things of that nature. Montgomery County certainly has been a star in that regard. So it's a continuation of looking at transit options, of looking at, at ways to get to work other than the automobile. And uh, I will tell you that I'm very supportive of what you all are doing in terms of looking at BRT and a lot of these, these corridors. Um, I think it has a very uh, small footprint. The purple line, for example, would have been 30, basically a third of the cost that it is now uh, had we gone with bus rapid transit on secure the, the secured right of way the state and county have preserved. So, uh, council member, I know this is a little extended, but I do think the science is there for sustainable buildings, and I think the board, with its approvals, needs to make sure that the value, economic value, job generation of a potential new building site for commercial purposes is done in a way that minimizes the environmental impact, is built on adequate public facilities, and is built in a way that's environmentally sustainable. Thank you, Council Member Friedson. Um, the balance of environment and places where we live are crucial, and I think Thrive 2050 looks at mixed use and the application of mixed use buildings where you have the combination of residences and you have workplaces and or stores. And when you have that integration of workplaces and living spaces, you reduce the impact on the environment. And if you increase uh, bike lanes, walking paths, and the way people want to live in, in urban areas or in residential areas, and you make the daily services more accessible to those people, it has a less environmental impact. And I believe Thrive 2050 points out the use of mixed-use facilities and businesses that take advantage of bike paths, walking lanes, and the reduction in use of automobiles to get to and from work or to and from their daily activities and or schools. And when you create developments and plans that incorporate workplaces, shopping centers, um, services such as grocery stores, it reduces the environmental impact. And so looking through the lens of 25th, through the lens of Thrive 2050 and the growth impact, you have to be deliberate in making sure that the applications contain information with regards to environmental resilience and making sure, is this a place where we could have mixed use? Is there a building currently in use that's quote unquote a white elephant that's been not occupied in 10 years? What could this space be? Up in the Aspen Hill area, there was a large development behind the Home Depot Center, a building that had not been in use for years. Um, now the building has been raised, and I'm hopeful that the plan for that is to have a mixed use where you could have residential and office space, residential and commercial retail space, something to that effect. So when you look at the places where we live and environmental impact, we need to consider having something where we reduce travel time, we reduce the use of cars, and we encourage walking and bicycles. When we reduce the use of cars, we, we reduce the environmental impact with regards to emissions. So we have to balance it and we have to push for it. We have to ask the tough questions to the planning staff. Is there a better use for this space than what is proposed by this development application? Is this development application in compliance with the goals and objectives of Thrive 2050? So we push for it, we ask about it, and if it can be better used, we possibly suggest changes in the application or changes in the development that would be best for the, our environment and community. Thank you. Councilmember Mink. Thank you both for being here today. Um, I wanted to give you a chance to speak about community engagement. Um, how will you ensure that the planning board improves its outreach to and co-creation of policy with residents, uh, including those who have not traditionally been engaged in planning decisions? And how should the planning board balance community input with the expertise and judgment of planning board commissioners? And I'm just gonna give you a second one and then leave it to you to balance 
um, how you want to uh, spend your time answering the two. My second question um, is, uh, what does it mean to you to incorporate a lens of environmental resilience in regards specifically to transportation policy? If there's anything you wanted to add on that, and um, can you speak to where the environmental resilience and climate justice lens falls as a priority uh, in relation to other considerations and how those are balanced? Sure. Um, Councilman, Mig I, I think the, the first issue is really the community engagement one you've mentioned. And it's, it's, I think it's very important to be transparent from the beginning to end in terms of any issues, studies were, that are being worked on and having public input to it. I was recently, as I mentioned, I haven't been involved in recent years in, in a lot of the matters in Montgomery County, but I, I'm looking at the website and understanding uh, the staff, many, some of whom I know, I think they do a remarkable job of trying to reach out to the community for comment and information, both in terms of the postings that occur weekly on the agenda, as well as to direct outreach to get people involved in the discussions of input on master plans from the local community level uh, and across the board from the diverse community that Sean, Sean mentioned. So I, I think as a member of the board, uh, it obviously, overseeing the staff, ensuring that that outreach occurs in an efficient way, utilizing social media and other, other direct means, uh, I would, we need to do that. We cannot have um, anything less than that. I would mention something that I was involved in recently that uh, we have succeeded on. It's just a, uh, being on the village board, I was asked to head up Montgomery Municipal Cable Channel 16 and I was intrigued by it because for years I've seen it and, uh, and visited it. But, you know, candidly, one of my concerns in getting it, I've been present for a year and a half, was how do we build the social media outreach of Channel 16 to really get more people involved in municipal issues that it faces. It does a remarkable job. It's only got three staff. Its annual budget is, is about a half a million dollars. It's a small operation, but they do a very, very good job in covering events in the, in the municipalities in Montgomery County, 19 municipalities, and try to encourage input from those communities. I was talking just yesterday to the mayor of Garrett Park, and she was volunteering that she would like to do a regular program on the history of Garrett Park, and that would be a new addition to kind of some of the programming that, that we've done in the past. So I think it is taking advantage of social media. I will tell you, I'm not necessarily the most informed and intelligent user of social media, but it's growing. I have my iPhone and I'm beginning to use it more. But I think it's very important that the board uh, have very aggressive outreach and involvement of all community groups. On the second question, dealing with obviously an understanding of environmental impacts on the infrastructure decisions that the board would make. I noted that we're, we're looking at the growth and transportation plan this year several times. Um, again, um, the reality of adding any transportation system right now has the conformity challenges we had of years ago is a little less because automobiles are candidly more efficient. But you have to look at basically how do you get people, to provide the mobility needed for people to get from work to their home place in the most efficient way both economically and environmentally. And I think the county's doing a very good job on that, candidly. I think, you know, the bike and pedestrian paths, I think the action the council has, the, both the council and the planning board have visited on those issues are very progressive. Montgomery County is often uh, looked at as being a real leader in looking at pedestrian and bike inclusion on uh, whether it's a road or, or transit uh, plan. I know that the state of Maryland, and I've met Wes Morris with him Saturday night talking a little bit about transportation, whether he pushes forward totally in the, with Governor Hogan's former plan or not, what is there is $600 million to look at trans, transit improvements that would make that plan less impactful in terms of the environment. And so I think there's money there and there's certainly interest, and I think we're the board and colleagues on the board can contribute, we'd be happy to do so. Um, Councilmember Meek. Councilmember Meek, thank you for your questions. Um, community engagement is essential to um, a planning board. The application process actually calls for two opportunities for community members to receive notice from the proponent of the application. 
Um, I think that there is a critical role in allowing the community members to participate. Sometimes the notices are put up and people drive by and they see this white sign on a piece of property and they don't necessarily understand that it is an opportunity for them to come to a meeting, engage in the meeting, and uh, have the opportunity to ask questions. There's a certain part where there are meetings where the citizens don't get a chance to ask questions, but the initial phases of the application process, the citizens get to participate. And I think it would be important for the board to encourage the planning staff to work cooperatively with the development applic applicant to advertise, market, not just put up a sign and say, hey, we're thinking about putting a you know condominium community in this old church parking lot. I think that we have to mandate that applicants do more than post a sign. Because the sign, people's busy workaday lives, when they drive by and see this white poster board sign with fine writing on it, they're not going to stop and take time out of their day to read it. Um, one of the things I often complain about is the deterioration in our local media newspapers. I love the Montgomery County Gazette. We don't have it anymore. Uh, and newspapers did a great job in communicating the message of um, meetings, development plans. The internet is instantaneous. It comes and goes. A social media post comes and goes on to the next interesting things, and it doesn't last. Sometimes you're on social media and you see a post and you don't write it down or you can't find it again. So I think there has to be a more coordinated effort with the development applicant, person submitting the development plan, and the board to say, hey, did you post somewhere else? Did you advertise somewhere else? Now. Um, can we force them to do it? I think it's highly suggestive that if they don't do it and we don't have enough community input or participation, we need to say, hey, you posted this, this is a major development, and we have no one in attendance today. Should we go on with this plan, or should you be charged with going out and reengaging the community to be a part of it? Because when a new development comes in, traffic patterns change, school student to teacher ratio can change. Um, availability to amenities can change and during the pandemic one of the things that I learned uh, we had an initiative um, at the primary care coalition called the Latino Health Initiative and it was all about communication are they aware of the personal protection equipment that they need are they aware how the disease is transmitted um, and communication is key and we learned that during the pandemic and during our development phase, we're gonna to need to communicate. If we want everybody to participate through the lens of the 2050 Thrive, you gotta to communicate to diverse communities. Was it posted in Spanish? Was it posted in Aramaic, right? Was it posted in a language um, Tagalog, Filipino, Filipino community, right? We have to push for it. We want to have participation and we want to hear the voices of all the community members. I shop at Wheaton Town Center, Costco, and my son, son loves sneakers. I go to Wheaton Town Center and I hear all different kind of languages. If there's a proposal going in for the Wheaton Town Center and the sign is only in English, will all the people who use the Wheaton Shopping Center be able to participate in the meeting or will they be able to read the sign and say, hey, I have an interest in this development project? Your second question is um, transportation and how, where is it on our list of importance or priorities? I think first is, is affordable housing and second is transportation. Um, when I interviewed for the Primary Care Coalition, and, and this was back in I think 2008, 2004, and they said, why do you want to be a part of this? Why is public health an in, in interest? And I said, well, if there's somebody on the metro who has tuberculosis, we want the county or the government to step up and do their part. So when you look at public transportation, no matter where you live in the county, no matter your social economic status, we may be sharing the bus with somebody. We may be sharing the bus station with somebody. We may be sharing the metro with somebody. So, so transportation is important. It's where everybody from the community interacts and uses it, whether or not it's silent interaction or verbal interaction. Most of us don't talk to one another on the metro or the bus anyway because of the, uh, the comfort level, right? But it's important. 
and how we live and how we use transportation to get to work, make a living, pay our taxes, and support the shared resources of the community is highly important. What's very interesting in Washington, D.C. recently, I think it was last night, they approved free buses or something, something of that sort, right? Transportation is important, so important that they said, hey, we're going to let people travel free. Um, people are still working in office buildings, people in retail, people in certain commercial aspects still have to use transportation. And if they are successful in traveling to their jobs and minimize commute and using public transportation as opposed to a car, the travel times are less and you can get there just as fast and just as conveniently as a car, I think people would consider it. So I think affordable housing is first, transportation is second on my list of priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Stewart. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and answering our questions. Um, so my question is around um, transparency. As you both know, if you've been paying attention, um, there has been uh, questions raised by some folks regarding the um, transparency and decision making of the planning board. And you know, whether whatever your opinions are on that, there are. Um, you know, questions out there. Um, in addition, people have raised questions about the process around Thrive 2050. Um, moving forward, because we want to move forward, um, if you are selected for the planning board, how do you plan to address, you know, these concerns that some people have and work towards building confidence and trust in the planning board? Well, Councilmember Stewart, thank you. I, obviously, um, the transparency issue in any public position is, is paramount. And uh, fortunately, I think we're, uh, COVID had a horrible impact on all of us. But the reality is it did, in fact, leverage the efficiency of hybrid meetings and engaging on in Zoom meetings and discussion, which does multiply the efforts of being able to, to ensure that work that's going on daily that might not be um, in fact, uh, people cannot attend. That they, It can be on a hybrid meeting schedule and people can see it when they come home. So I think it's really focused on using technology to reach people and make sure that all that is planned is published in advance and is online and that all meetings are, in fact, accessible and easy. I'll give you uh, just a case again on the municipality level here in Montgomery County. Before COVID, I, I think only two of the 19 municipalities really covered their, I think I've got that right, uh, their monthly meetings. And as a result of COVID, obviously, which you all experienced as well, um, you know, we were not meeting. And uh, what has ended up happening is that all the municipalities now, a, good, a majority of them now are covering their meetings hybridly. So it is, again, as it extends the opportunity to engage more people, ensure that they're educated about what's coming up on the planning board agenda, you know, what's in in the report stage from the staff on an issue, and, and getting that out. I think uh, the reality is we're probably more transparent now as a result of practices we had to incorporate during COVID than we were before. And, um, you know, it's a part of the role of the board, of the planning board, to ensure that that happens, that everything that is being discussed is open and everything that is, uh, you know, in terms of released is released uniformly to all constituencies and all communities. Thank you for your question, Council Member Stewart. Um, transparency is important. And I think part of being transparent is communicating that we're in the people service business and not merely in the building development business. We have to make ourselves available for questions. We have to make ourselves available for answers. And we have to follow up. If someone asks a question and wants redress, we have to give them redress. And when we give them redress, we follow up and say, did we give you enough information? When we avoid questions and we avoid answering those questions, it gives the, the perception of not being transparent. But if we open ourselves up to criticism, questions and inquiry, I think that the issue of transparency is met. Uh, as a lawyer and dealing with clients, I often have to tell them the truth. They might not like it, but I have to tell them the truth. And when we tell them the truth, we have a higher level of satisfaction amongst the clients that I deal with daily. 
So as a planning board, we have to recognize we're in a people business and people have questions. It's not about buildings, it's about people. And when we answer their questions willingly, gladly, and make ourselves available, I think the issue of transparency will be met and we'll be successful in doing our work as a planning board. Thank you. Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you both, um, not just for your application to serve in this capacity, but each of you in looking at your resumes in your own way, both personally and professionally, have conducted public service. And so I really uh, just want to extend my appreciation to both of you. I also want to uh, thank both of you for acknowledging the great staff at the planning department. Uh, we are very protective of that staff, <laughs> no more so than Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez, yeah. Um, yeah. because they are terrific <laughs> and have uh, been through a lot, to say the least. Yeah. Um, my question is, one of the first significant orders of business, once the board is reconstituted to fill out the full terms, probably as early as this summer, um, and certainly into the fall, will be hiring a planning director. Uh, and we are fortunate uh, to have had some excellent planning directors in the history of this county. And I want to publicly acknowledge and thank Ms. Tanya Stern, who is serving more than ably uh, in an acting capacity through some tumultuous and difficult times and frankly doing a really great job. But if each of you from 30,000 feet, obviously without resumes in front of you, could talk a little bit about what you will be looking for in a planning, board, in a planning director, uh, I, I think the public would be interested in knowing that. So I'll start with you, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Albernez. I, I would be looking for someone who's a great communicator and a leader someone who's vested in the community, invested in Thrive 2050. Are they socially and, and equity conscious? Are they environmentally conscious? And are they competitive economically in letting all the community members participate, not only in, in living, but in building? Are they fostering applications from diverse candidates, from diverse companies? Are they looking to expand opportunity for everyone in the county? They have to be highly communicative. They have to be an inspirational leader to motivate the staff to ask the tough questions, to scrutinize applications, to, to make sure that these development plans are going to meet the objectives of the county in serving us all. It's a tough spot because Montgomery County, let's face it, has been been successful economically. It's so successful that people, if you gave them a choice to live anywhere else in the state of Maryland, most people are going to choose Montgomery County if they had a choice. And we need to make sure that that new planning director considers everybody, everyone. And they have to push forward. They can't wallow in the status quo, right? Sure, we were successful. Sure, the 1950 general plan was successful, but we're moving upward, onward, and beyond that. And we have to make sure that they have new innovative ideas and energies that mesh with Thrive 2050. Thank you. Council Member, um, I think that, you know, I acknowledged that early on in my commentary that filling that role is a top priority and, and near term priority. Obviously, uh, Montgomery County has a history of being one of the most well-regarded planning efforts in the country. I mean, it's, it's often looked at as a model in terms, uh, you know, Article 28, obviously, and its responsibilities on, uh, given to it on planning and zoning, but also looking at both the zoning and subdivision ordinances. A new planning director that the that would be considered would have to be knowledgeable about those, you know, authorizing legislation and being comfortable with it and having had experience dealing with an agency that has those kinds of authorities. I think that's number one. Number two, clearly leveraging the existing talent at, at the agency, which I think is substantial. Um, I think the development community, whether it's the home building community or the commercial development community, really has very good relationships and respects for the planning board staff. So looking at a leader that not only understands the authority and the role and mission of the agency, but also being able to oversee the divisions within park and planning, uh, give them uh, guidance, obviously, and hold them accountable for timelines and work product and that kind of thing. 
but also give them you know stimulation and, and give them an example of leadership. So I I don't feel that there'll be any uh, lack of candidates for the planning board director. Uh, this, as I say, Montgomery County is often held up as a, the, a golden uh, a job, really, for a lot of people in planning. I, I'm a I go to meetings monthly of a group called Lambda Alpha, which is the land use uh, honor society that is headed up by a woman named Lisa Ross. Many of you all might know she was the head of ULI here in Washington, and she retired about two years ago. Now she's heading up Lambda Alpha. There are people in that room that will apply, I'm sure, and they're all high-quality people that look at. The other day we were um, we were being briefed on a development north of Richmond that was very interesting. It was a surplus. It was an old corporate center that became surplus, and it was vacated. And the, uh, Henrico County in Virginia was very interested. It's north of Richmond, so it's not a part of Richmond Down Center. But uh, the developers come in and proposed a green city, basically, and he's you know, come up with a proposal that won support from the county, and that's the kind of thing that Montgomery County does as well. But um, in that room were a bunch of people that would be very good planning directors in Montgomery County. So I, I think there'll be a lot of interest. I think we need to make sure we select somebody that understands the authority that the board is based on, the accountability and timeline, and candidly, as my comment earlier, I think just making it as efficient as possible. I am concerned, as many of you all are, uh, Counts, uh, uh, Maryland uh, uh, ran a chamber in North County. Uh, retaining the business community in Montgomery County should be a top priority, as is equity, as is uh, affordable housing, or what they call attainable housing. All these things are important and are part of what the Montgomery County Planning Board would do to advise you all for action. But I will tell you that it is going to be challenging with the constraint in office occupancy with businesses saying, like my law firm, that reduced its space by 30% over the last two years, there are going to be companies in Montgomery County that will start saying, well, wait a minute, if our people are commuting, you know, if they're working from home two days a week and in the office three days a week, do we need this office building or do we need this space? Maybe we should consolidate. So I think we're on the verge of really some challenges, and, I, and it really does direct itself to the efficiency of the planning board and being responsive to needs for proposals for growth and development and being responsive to that constituency as well as we are communicating with all constituencies. So I think it's a challenging time, candidly. You. And, and you're going to have conversion of office buildings to apartments. There are 20 office buildings in downtown Washington that are now being converted to apartments. And that's not an easy task, but we're going to see that in the county for sure. I'm, but anyway, I've gone off a little bit. apologize. Thank you very much. Uh, now, turn it over to a uh, council member who knows what it's like to answer questions before the council on the planning board, council member Fanny Gonzalez. Yay. Um, good morning. My name is Natalie Fanny Gonzalez. Thank you. I feel so excited to see two talented individuals applying to the planning board. Um, that really makes me happy to, to tell you the truth. Um, the question that I had was actually uh, pretty similar to the question council member Gabriel Bornos raised because what's up in my mind right now is who's going to be your next planning director and you already touched on that. Um, let's not forget that we also have a parks director. Right. So when you're answering your questions, remember it's not just the planning department, right. it's the parks department right. and they uh, play such a significant role for economic development in our county, believe it or not. Uh, plus, we also have the Maryland National Capital Parking Planning Commission um, Executive Director that right. you also had to meet, and and um, I, I found it rewarding to be working closely with our colleagues from Prince George's County. Um, that's actually a great thing. Um, I have to tell you, the Aspen Hill location that you mentioned, Kaiser Permanente is going there, so you know. <laughs> um, I. The time conflict, I wish somebody had told me before I applied, this is not a part-time position. When I joined the planning board, my kids were one and two years old. I have a full-time job. I have five employees at that point, uh, and I was able to delegate. And I had to let go of every single nonprofit I was a board member of. And I see that you're a member of a, quite a few. 
you cannot be raising money. Because when you are, once you're on a planning board, you have to let that go. So I need you to understand that, because I don't think you guys knew that, uh, based on your answers. Um, I honestly, um, for the planning director and the parks director, and although you already answered uh, council members up on those questions, I still feel like I need somebody to, to make sure that whoever takes on that position, it's somebody with a vision. And it's somebody who can, it's not just about being communicative, but it's somebody who will bring the board together, especially during conflict. You have no idea how difficult it is to deal with site plans when you have neighbors going one way and other neighbors going the other way. And, and having the planning director take on that role to ensure that we're moving forward without thinking of the politics is key. So I, I just need somebody coming to the planning board ready to think that way, that this is somebody who's going to take on, especially understand that you're all replaceable. I was there for seven years, no. and then I left. No. I'm going to be here for a while, and then I can easily be replaced by somebody else um, in a few years. Uh, but the planning director will stay there for 20 years, 30 years. So that's like the most critical thing that you're going to be tackling. Um, anything else that you didn't say before that you feel that you need to say now after hearing me? Because <laughs> um, yeah. that's, that's what's in my mind right now. Yeah, so. I, I agree. I think when we examine the past problems of the planning board, um, there's, there seemed to be a battle between the staff and the board, like the, the board getting involved with the day-to-day -day management. And the new planning director is going to have to be somebody who's firm and fierce and says, although you're appointed and although though you make the final decision, you can't treat my staff that way. And they're going to have to champion their staff and they're going to have to champion the board and they're going to have to balance it. It's going to take somebody with great personal resolve and strength to do it. So I agree with you. It's an important position. Yeah, um, council member, I think the, you know, Mike Riley does a, I think a very good job on the, on the park side, but you're, you're correct. I think part of it is obviously being thoroughly educated on the land use and master planning process, whether it's here in Montgomery County or elsewhere, as they're you know applying for the job. Uh, I also think your comment about visionary is important. You've been on the board and you spent years on the board, so you, you see that. Uh, again, I'm maybe I'm. You were there. I was not, but uh, I am optimistic, given the nature of this county, the sophistication of the county. The fact that this county is an amazing spot, I mean, both in terms of quality of life, diversity, but there are not many counties like it. You know, if you think about um, the federal priorities now for President Biden's administration, we have several agencies headquartered in this county that are in the front line of that, you know, with the FDA, NIH, National Cancer Institute. Uh, I think, uh, as I understand it, the county executive, you all are very involved in a in an opportunity that's there right now to be developed, and it is that uh, there is a proposal that Biden uh, advanced two years ago to create a center for advanced research in health called ARP to H. It's similar to one in Northern Virginia for defense. It's out. I visited the building. It is a golden opportunity. We are on it. We are focused. Yeah, <laughs> it's a golden opportunity from Montgomery County. So back to your point about vision. It requires somebody that understands how damn important this could be <laughs> and figuring out what the, what you all need in an advisory way to make the right decisions to staff that kind of offer out. It's going to be an offer. It's going to be probably made by the White House, HHS, and NIH. NIH Real Estate Department is the one staffing it, right? So you got to convince them that Montgomery County is a spot for that. That means that you need a planning director, you know, that has vision, as you suggest, but has had experience and say, okay, well, we've got an unusual, diverse, wonderful county, and we've got these incredible agencies that everybody would want. So how do we leverage all that in terms of talent work, you know, and also amenities and schools and, and housing, affordable housing, but that's going to take somebody uh, with imagination to support you all in terms of supplying the information to win that. 
I think it's winnable. If you were to ask me today, and I headed up GSA for a while, so I know what goes into uh, citing a federal facility, I think it's Montgomery County's to lose at this point. And uh, so you need a planning director that has the capability, knowledge, leadership to be able to support that, that kind of approach, that kind of pursuit. Thank you. Councilmember Sales. Thank you, President Glass. I want to start by thanking our two interviewees for applying to this important role and sharing your thoughts about the planning process and your vision for how Montgomery County should look in the future. Um, the pandemic has highlighted inequities in our county and country. We know now that there still exists statutes and processes that may continue to make living and thriving challenging for seniors aging in place and residents of color. Given the vast demographic changes in Montgomery County in the past decade and the effects of the pandemic in alerting us to racial, ethnic, environmental, and economic inequities, how do you see the role of the planning board as an institution of equity and competitiveness now and in the future? And since we heard last from, oh, whoever wants to take it first. I think the planning board, um, first of all, thank you, uh, Council Member Sales, for your question. Mm -hmm. The planning board can play an active role in equity and racial justice. And I mentioned earlier is they have to ask developers tough questions. Um, how will this best serve everyone in the community? Is there going to be affordable housing in this community? Are there going to be different levels of housing in the community that uh, people can afford to participate in and purchase? So when you ask those tough questions and you look at it through the, lot, the lens of 2050, you can play a tremendous role in developing living communities that address these inequities. Um, an example would be, unfortunately, there are um, square footage requirements for some developments, right? So in Up County, you have square footage requirements. You can't build a house unless you have a certain amount of acres. Well, if you're going to build a house with a, with a, a maximum amount of acreage required, what does that do? It decreases the affordability of that development or style of living. So if you change the zoning regulation with regards to square footage required for a single family home, um, it can play a great role in having um, equity and diversity and who can purchase in that community based on the, the um, unfortunate fact of socioeconomic strata between the different racial groups. Right? And so if you change that, the square footage of the dwelling place, the square footage of the, um, the parcel, it has a significant impact on who can buy and live in that area. Another thing to consider is the minimum square footage for a living space and whether or not that living space could accommodate more than the quote unquote nuclear family. Is it a multi-generational dwelling? So the planning board has a tremendous role and effect in recommending policies and statute changes that can um, open up community participation to everyone. Um, Councilman Sells, thank you. I, I do feel that the board uh, and the work of the staff and the board does have tools available. And obviously, the development approval process in terms of the equities that Sean mentioned, in terms of the aggressive inclusion of minority businesses that can compete for uh, for building and other things, as you know, the county and the state both. Uh, Maryland on, on transportation projects has a very uh, high, high goal in that regard. And that's a part of all this. I think we need to review um, both the merits of the project, but also the impact of the community, what the economic impact and benefits would be and how they are shared with the communities that supports it. Uh, I also think, obviously, through the design guidelines issues that we deal with in terms of how projects are, in fact, in areas are, in fact, designed, that you can reinforce some of those objectives as well. Uh, but I, I, again, I just think the openness and the nature of Montgomery County, inclusive nature of it, um, you know, ensures that the board and direction to the staff will maximize that as much as possible. 
Thank you. Councilmember Balcom. Hi. Hi. Thank you all um, for being here and thank you for your service, your public service. Um, this is a great follow up to Councilmember Sales' uh, question. Uh, we are a richly diverse community, uh, but not only racially and culturally, but also geographically. Uh, can you both talk about your understanding and vision for the different planning and transportation needs? of our urban, suburban, rural parts of our uh, richly diverse community. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Bobson, nice to see you again. I appreciate it. I, I think that, you know, when you're looking at the, obviously, both of us have talked a, a lot about the 2050 plan, but if you look at the, the business ahead of the board in terms of what they submitted to, the, to you all for approval, Obviously, Silver, Silver Spring is one of the first uh, pl planned looks. Uh, highly urbanized center, and I, you know, I think it's obvious the transportation, a lot of investments occurred in that, and how do you leverage that? Now you've got a potential, it won't open for a few more years, unfortunately, but a light rail link with a purple line that adds dimensions to that as a highly dense urban area. Uh, you've got more, you have the rustic roads plan that's coming before the board to look at in terms of how do you deal with the scenic nature of the, some of the roads in the county and how do you preserve that. Uh, the University Boulevard uh, plan is going to be looked at. I mean, there's a very, you know, very congested urban parkway that has different needs and needs to be viewed differently in terms of what are the solutions. Because you get right away constraints, you got, you know, certainly traffic and 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 things of that nature. Uh, Clarksburg um, is another one on the agenda in mid-year. Um, Wheaton downtown is another, you know, the planning board's there now, a new addition, but uh, it has a different structure and has, has d different needs. Um, the life science Carter study, as I've said, um, you know, I think that that will dominate a lot of the discussion going forward uh, as a major priority economically for the county. How do we take the high talent, the high, you know, education of a lot of the population and certainly the supercomputer abilities within the county as well as the life science resources, that's going to be one that takes a different look in terms of Shady Grove and issues up there and what's needed uh, in Carter Transit Way. Um, and then, uh, so I do think it requires both a look at growth corridors and what are the constraints there and how do we accommodate uh, new growth along those as well as the urban cores of Bethesda and, and Wheaton and, and uh, Silver Spring. Um, but I do feel that the planning staff in the past has done a very, command I haven't read all their studies, but does a very good job of getting input, getting back, input from the communities in advance before any kind of draft is done. And uh, I think, you know, I'm confident that the staff with good leadership to come will, you know, will be able to deal with the different context of transportation and inadequate public facilities in the different areas that the board's going to be looking at over the coming year. Thank you for your question, Councilmember Valcom. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, your question is how do we balance the diversity and transportation needs, correct? The question is we have these different, distinctly different areas, rural, suburban, urban, and just want to get from you uh, your understanding of those areas and mm -hmm. the different um, planning and transportation needs from each of those areas. My friends in the Agricultural Reserve in Up County and Ashton and Brookville have different transportation needs than the people who live in downtown Silver Spring or Mid County. Um, and we have to look at the um, justification of whether or not you would put a bus stop or bus route through Ashton and Brookville and whether or not we had the capacity to support it, whether or not the frequency of the routes in Ashton and Brookville could be supported. The frequency of routes in Mid County or Down County can be adjusted, and we know the need when you, we look at the 29 corridor, the Georgia Avenue corridor. I live in East County, east of um, Georgia Avenue, east of Connecticut Avenue, and there's high transportation need and high transportation um, requirement because of the density of the population. And the needs of the community are di there are different than the needs of the community in Ashton and Brookville. 
right? They live in a more rural community, not as densely populated. So there's not going to be a need for bus hub. There's not going to be a need for metro or light rail stop because they're, they don't have the density or population to support it. But in mid-county, down-county, they need it. And if we increase public transportation to serve the, the, the community members to get to and from work, to and from shopping, or to and from friends and family, it's important that we balance that. And when we look at dollars or priorities or the time, time is the most valuable resource of the staff, where is their focus going to be better well spent? Is it going to be better well spent focusing on down county and mid county? Or is it going to be well spent focusing on the agricultural reserve in places like Bookville and Ashton, right? So we have to balance that and we have to ask the tough questions. Hey, how much time are you spending on this, this transportation plan for, for Ashton and Brookville and how much time are you spending for the transportation plan in downtown Silver Spring and Wheaton? Interesting thing, I travel the Georgia Avenue corridor and 29 cap corridor going to and from work daily. And what's interesting there is the transportation needs have changed in the time since I've gone there. The speed limit has been reduced. There's been an emphasis on signage. There's been an emphasis on curbs. There's been an emphasis on gates and direction of foot traffic. So there's an emphasis based on those things because of the density of the population and the change of the population. Let's face it, the demographics are different in Ashton, in Brookville, in Up County, in the Agricultural Reserve. Because traditionally, those properties are legacy properties. They're people like Dr. Bird and um, Farquhar families. Those properties were owned by large agricultural farm owners, right? And so they've maintained the complexion of the community in terms of size of houses, size of requirements, and so they don't need the transportation focus as other areas in the community um, require. So I'm able to balance it because I'm involved in those communities. I'm engaged in outdoor activities and I have friends in Brookville and Ashton, and I live and work in mid-county and down-county. So I'm connected to those places and I understand that the focus of the planning board and its team has to be different when considering the different parts of our community. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And thank you both for applying and your interests and your answers. And I can tell you that you have made this a very difficult decision. And that speaks very, very well of both of you. You've touched on my concern with some of your other answers. But during Thrive, one of the concerns that we heard, that I heard, was that the planning board during their many meetings and outreach uh, discussions continually mentioned that they had met with the community many times, et cetera. But in some instances, the public mentioned that, yes, you're meeting with us, but your minds have already been made up. You listen only to one side, but not my side. And whether that was fair or unfair, uh, that was the perception of some. So my question is, how do you ensure that a person who was testifying knows that they are truly being listened to and their thoughts will be considered? Thank you. Mayor, I, I would just start out by saying I think it, in the context of meetings of the planning board, I think it's really just making sure that, that they understand they're being fully heard and that the record will include their comments and be fully considered and balanced with the other. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, um, we're having in our community, uh, Down County in Chevy Chase, we're having a lot of issues with cut through traffic that has been caused by the District of Columbia uh, closing the counterflow lanes in the AM peak and peak. So they basically kept the, pre, the COVID conditions post COVID. So now you've got basically two lanes in, in southbound. And what it's done, it's, it's created backup on Connecticut Avenue and cut through to a various number of communities along Connecticut Avenue all the way to the Beltway. So we've had people continually come to our board and, and talk about how this is a new thing, that before they never saw a car, and now they're getting you know 20 cars in, in one hour in the peak, peak hour coming through. And, you know, I was very careful because there's a lot of hesitancy. You know, it's a state road. 
we're joining the jurisdiction of the District of Columbia who's responsible for planning their road system. And yet we were, I, I tried really to take that input and to try to, there was some consternation between other members of the board about whether we, for example, could authorize a road hump on a very narrow block. Their, their street uh, was very narrow. And, you know, their input was considered, but I don't think got fully considered as it should. So I made a point to reach out and to make sure that they understood we're going to take this seriously because the chief of police is going to evaluate this and try to address the problem. It was a new problem created by traffic decisions south, but it impacted their quality of life. So I think it's, it's the same way at the planning board level, it's just ensuring that they're, uh, obviously there's ex party communications issues and things of that nature, but uh, just make sure they understand you're listening and that you'll fully consider their interests. Thank you for your question, Council Member Katz. Um, and I believe your question was, how do we make sure that the community members know that we're listening to them and ensure them that we are considering their thoughts and input? I was, <laughs> and, and, and I was lucky enough before I went to law school to work for a couple of major corporations as a customer service and sales representative. And I majored in communications at the University of Maryland. And we're in the client services business. We're all in the people services business. And to get the best results with our clients and the community members we serve, you have to acknowledge them first. You say, thank you for participating. Your involvement and energy is important because the decisions that we're going to make are going to affect you directly. We let them know we appreciate their attendance. They could be somewhere else. They could be using their time somewhere else, but they chose to get involved. And oftentimes, the one person that comes and is involved has the guts to show up and that the concern that they're expressing in the, in the community is also the concern of many others, but because of time and because of um, nerves or the feeling that they won't be acknowledged, they don't show up. But the person that does show up, we need to make sure we show them that we appreciate them. And then if they ask a question, we need to follow up and repeat their question and say, is this what you're asking? Am I understanding you correctly? And then we clarify. And once we clarify and we make sure that we understand them correctly, we answer them. And then if they don't understand, we answer them again. And we make them feel confident that they're a part of the process and that our minds weren't made up that we're there to consider the community, we're there to serve the community, and it's not about the developers, but it's about the people who make up the community and the places in which we live. So I'm confident that I could make the community members feel as though their, their thoughts and questions are being fairly considered. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and, and also want to echo colleagues' appreciation for your putting yourselves forward, and you're both busy, accomplished folks, and you care about the community, that's clear, um, and it's going to be a tough decision for us. Uh, I want to, I'm the chair of the Education and Culture Committee. I want to ask you something that I don't think has been touched upon today in any of the previous questions or, or by you and your comments. Uh, in 2020, the previous council, we took up, at the recommendation of the planning board, uh, a growth and in infrastructure policy uh, that made a lot of changes in how we move forward and assess fees and impact taxes and eliminated moratorium and did a lot of things that are connected to our growth and in infrastructure overall, but also very connected to our school system, uh, whereas, as you, you may know, a lot of these fees are portions of them direct to school construction. You, Mr. Winstead, mentioned, both of you have, but you in particular, about what might be coming and how we're in a different period of time uh, as far as economic development and mm -hmm. three-day work weeks or, for, you know, working from home, all these things that are changing our potential revenues. In that policy, and I didn't agree with all of it, but I worked through it, uh, there were some decisions made that reduced the amount of income that came to schools for construction. Uh, we have since not corrected that. There was also discussion about we would come back and try to backfill that through recordation tax or other ways that are under our authority. But the planning board does have a role uh, in school utilization, 
uh, and uh, also on things like making recommendations around growth and infrastructure policy. I'd love to know your thoughts and how you see, uh, what do you see to be the importance in the role you might play and any thoughts you have on those sets of issues because they're on top of my mind as we take up the CIP uh, in the operating budget for the school system, which is obviously really important for our students and our competitiveness. Yeah, um, thank you, Council Member Jawando. Um, I know of your involvement in schools and the importance of schools to you because you have children engaged in the <laughs> public schools here in Montgomery County. I think when I looked at the um, the growth infrastructure policy and I looked up the utilization of premium payment. We can't just allow developers come in and drop in a development that's going to increase the population and not consider the children that are going to be attending those schools. I think it's fair to ask a developer to contribute to the schools. I think it's fair to ask them to pay a portion of the, um, the resources that are going to be utilized in educating uh, the children and the families that move in the community. So when, and, and being a part of the uh, Maryland State Board of Education and looking at the blueprint for Maryland's future, it's all about getting the funding in place to transform our student populations and to give them the adequate services they need. If there's a new building that needs to be constructed, we need to get that in place. Um, recently, my son was participating in a basketball game for William Farquhar, and I believe they went to Loiterman um, to play a game, and my, my, I wasn't able to attend because I was working, but they came back and they talked about the condition of the school and how fortunate they felt to be attending William Farquhar. They talked about the low ceilings and loitermen. They talked about um, the lighting in the gymnasium. They need a new school. And if there's gonna be development in that area, and if the student population is gonna increase, right, and the student to teacher ratio is gonna increase, the developers need to play a role in contributing to the quality of life. And one of the most essential things in the quality of life is the quality of our schools that our community members will be utilizing. So when I look at the growth infrastructure plan with regards to the utilization premium payment, I think it's fair. And I think that developers should play a part in that. Mr. Mr. Weinstein. Council Member, do you want to? Um, you know, I think the uh, contribution of applicants for development is certainly important to share the burden and obviously the adequate public facilities section of the subdivision ordinance uh, addresses that. And I think, you know, as, as Sean said, I think the contribution uh, to support the school burden through the APC requirements is, is very equitable. And I, you know, I... I'm not familiar with actually the most recent fee structure change, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's in place. It's a large part of what the board would consider in terms of ensuring both adherence to the subdivision ordinance as well as the requirements of the APF going forward. Um, you know, I, the other issue was certainly one of the balance between residents and jobs in terms of where you know, that falls down. Uh, the more housing, affordable housing we have, the more burden we're going to have on the school system. And obviously the attainable housing goals that you all established in, in 2050 are, are going to drive that. You know, I think it will create uh, more attractable housing options in a variety of price range, hopefully, and that will bring more people here that potentially will have more bur burden on the schools, not less. So. You know, I think we just need to, the board needs to make sure that, you know, the subdivision ordinance and the APF requirements are, are fully met and equitably met. Um, yeah, and I would just ask that, you know, I know that I think this is going to be an issue that is going to have come up again uh, because we're going, to we're going to be trying from the state level, and I've talked to Governor Moore about this too, which is recently a Saturday as well, about we need more state aid for school construction. Right. Um, but... I think we're going to have to look about look at what our role is, and when I say our, I mean as as wide and as collective as possible. The county residents, developers, everyone, because we have some tension in what's happening. And I think I don't think it's adequate what we're doing. It's not because we, you know. And so I would ask that you just look into it more and and, and be up to speed on it because I think it's an important set of issues that may come, certainly will come before us, but may may come before the planning sure. board as well. So. Understood. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, rounding us out is Councilmember Ludke. 
Hi, yes, and thank you both for coming today and for your very comprehensive answers. Um, after listening to everybody's answers and having some time to reflect, I have a, a question um, specifically about how each of you would plan to check any preconceived notion or biases that you have regarding particular geographic areas or populations within the county. Some of the answers that have been given within the past 10 minutes have triggered that thought to me particularly related to Ashton where I live and Council Member Jawando lives and Loiterman Middle School where my husband spent 10 years teaching. So um, how would you, everybody has biases of one kind or another, so how would you each plan to address your preconceived notions or biases as you inform your work on the Planning Commission should you be selected? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member, I, um, I, I will confess that I did spend a part of my earlier career doing a lot of zoning work around metro stations, not here in, in Montgomery County. Uh, but, uh, and so I, do, I don't have a bias, but I, my, the focus has, from earlier careers, been around that sustainable density and growth mixed use, as Sean said, around transportation nodal points. But that does not mean that the uh, the communities countywide that have different, more suburban character, more rural character, don't deserve full consideration in any plans or any uh, advisory role that the board has in, in their planning. And so, um, you know, I really, from an equity standpoint, a diversity standpoint, I, you know, I've had the pleasure of heading up two major agencies, one on the state level and one on the federal level that have have huge hiring diversity plans in place with great diversity in terms of um, the people that wor work there. So I think I have, you know, I've managed and worked with environments where, um, you know, we're taking advantage of all talent and, and that exists and applying it to the um, applying to the subject at hand. I I really don't think that the board, in my sense, and it hasn't been in recent years, but uh, that they do a very good job of sort of balancing out all the communities in Montgomery County. I mean, you all as council members direct that, right, in terms of what the communities need or seeking and what, how the board can be helpful. So I really, uh, my personal biases won't come into play. I will say that professionally I have focused more <laughs> on transportation corridors and, uh, and TOD kind of development than ensuring more rural character, um, but, you know, being that the park, sir, park board is a part of, of this role, I certainly will, you know, would do everything possible to protect those assets, those natural resources. Uh, one other thing on the, with the park uh, is I, I noted that there was a historic element to this, reviewing a lot of the historic assets in the county. And interestingly enough, um, a large part of the role I had at GSA was ensuring that the federal assets, many of which, the average age of your federal buildings are 60 years plus. So they're all historic buildings. So I've had a lot of experience in looking at how do you, uh, how do you manage historic assets and how do you ensure, GSA did a remarkable job of taking the guidelines of the Interior Department and historic renovation and ensuring that we preserve those historic components, but also are able to develop and add capacity to that facility. So I think on, you know, I, I think I can handle both the different characters in the county, the ge different geographic areas, um, and, um, you know, hopefully be fair in the process. Thank you. Council Member Lukey, thank you for your question. Um, when I spoke of Ashton and Brookville, I highly revere that part of town and wish I had the foresight and knowledge to have moved there. <laughs> I, 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 my good friend Todd Greenstone, um, who's a farmer in the area, um, I hang out with him a lot and enjoy outdoor activities with him. So I hope I didn't uh, come across as having any um, negative bias toward that area as opposed to admiration for that area. But if I did have any bias, I, I am good at self-examination and I am good at understanding bias and trying not to base decisions based on any preconceived notion. Um, I'm a middle class kid. My grandfather was a coal miner. My, on my father's side, my, my mother's 
father, grandfather, was an industrial worker, served in World War I, and they both died of industrial diseases. So I come from a middle class background who's always strived. My parents didn't go to college, so I really don't have biases, so to speak. And if I came across as having a bias, I apologize. But I pointed out the differences in Loiterman and Farquhar because I think the investment in the two schools is substantially different. The kids are beautiful in both schools, and I believe they both deserve the best type of school to learn and achieve in. That's it. Um, but if I did have any bias, uh, I do a self-examination. And as I apologize to you for um, coming across as if I had a bias, I would do the same type of self-reflection and be a man enough and display the character I believe I have to address those biases publicly and confidentially with any team member who would believe that I was biased against them. Thank you, I appreciate your response. And yes, Farquhar is a newer building uh, because the old one was filled with mold and burnt down. Mm -hmm. Right, wow. so um, it is newer than Loiterman, right? But mm -hmm. there was a need, not just because it was in an area that was perceived as wealthier, but because the school burnt down. Okay. So, and there is a bus in Ashton. It might not get us everywhere we want to go, and we might need better transit service up well, there in well, Up well, County. Well, but well, there is. What a I bus. was reflecting is that the immediate need for public transportation in Down County and Mid County, because of the density of the population, is different than the need for transportation up there. A lot of people, um, Wheaton, for for example. Um, um, or the terminal end of the red line, I have um, employees who purposely pick to live in a town home or condominium in that area or apartment in that area for their ease of access to the metro station. So the type of development and the housing with regards to density is different than the needs with regards to the people who live in Ashton and Brookville. And when you look at economic feasibility, could it pay for itself if we have you know light rail or metro rail in Ashton or Brookville? Is it needed? Yeah. Are they worthy of public transportation? Yes. But is it a priority based upon the population density is the only thing I was reflecting on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, colleagues. I'm Mr. Winstead and Mr. Bartley. Thank you very much for your uh, thoughtful, comprehensive responses. Uh, as I noted at the beginning of this, this conversation, uh, today we are having uh, these interviews with you. Uh, one week from today, we will have a conversation with the unaffiliated candidates, and then the week thereafter, we will have the interviews with the Democratic candidates. So this process will go on a few more weeks, uh, so we will be in touch, but, uh, but thank you for putting yourselves forward. Thank you for the deep work you have already done in the community, uh, the recognition of where we've come from and where we need to go and appreciate both of you stepping forward. So thank you. Thank you, thank you President Class, thank you. and thank, thank you, thank you council members for your thoughtful <laughs> questions. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all thank very you. much. Appreciate it. Okay, colleagues. Now we're going to move over nice to the consent calendar. May I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Moved by council member Jawando. Second. Seconded by council member Stewart. All those in favor of the consent calendar, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Okay. And we are very ahead of schedule. Thank you all very much. Enjoy your lunch recess. We'll be back at 1.30.